Good morning again, everyone. <clears throat> it's 8.54 p.m. We're gonna start at approximately 9.02. Give individuals an opportunity to join in. Thank you again for taking your Saturday to be with us. Good morning, everyone. On a sunny Saturday morning. Mr. Jimmy, can you have the backup ready for me, please? As well as the code of conduct uh, presentation, just in case there's an issue. It's 8.59 a.m., ladies and gentlemen. We're gonna delay this to about 9.02 a.m. Give the stragglers an opportunity to log on. We're up to 39 participants. Thank you for taking your Saturday morning to join us. 54 participants. Okay, we're gonna get started. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to this Saturday, August 15, 2020. I'm Dr. Cook Proud, Superintendent of the Catskill Central School District, reporting to you live from 343 West Main Street, Catskill, New York, 12414. Uh, this morning, uh, we're gonna provide a reopening presentation for you. Uh, we're required by executive order from the governor to have three. Um, we actually had one scheduled for Thursday, but there was a delay and somewhat there was some Zoom um, circuit type of issue. So we apologize for that again. So thank you for taking your Saturday morning to be with us. Um, school districts across the state, 750 or so are required to have a reopening plan to um, present to parents in the community, reentering students and staff in a safe manner. As I mentioned in previous presentations, the safety and security of our students and staff are priority. You know, two years ago, we brought in our retired uh, armed officers to make sure that our students and staff remain safe to keep the bad guys out. Last year, we implemented the Raptor visitor management system where any visitors who come in have to scan a government issued ID. Um, it's pretty much, it prints out a, a badge that goes through a legal system to notify us if, it, if there's any type of custody issues, uh, restraints, etc. So, um, you know, we really take safety and security very seriously. More so, um, speaking of that, you know, my recommendation is to bring back uh, students in a phased in model, a progressional type of model, um, because right now there's a lot of uncertainty. If you look at the news, you will see that many um, school districts in our southern states are opening, closing, and, and reopening again. So that adds further frustration to you as a parent and as community members. Most recently in Albany, um, a daycare center at Albany Medical had a shutdown because you know there was some staff and students um, under their care who tested positive for COVID. So if you have a medical center, um, having difficulty getting this right, who's to say that a school district um, is not going to have any difficulty. So um, I'm going to present to you, again, an overview of my presentation. I'm not necessarily going to go slide by slide because I'm going to give our administrators an opportunity to present their building specific plans um, here in district. And I think that's very important. You know, my presentation is already recorded. It's on a district website for you to take a look at. In addition to that, we have a new normal video. So thank you to Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Lovera, Mr. Mioris, and our department leaders and administrators for um, assisting with that because that gives parents a visual perspective of what the new normal will look like. You know, I'm a visual learner. You can write anything you want on paper, but until I see it in action, you know, it's really not going to resonate uh, to me. So we all have all different types of learners as adults, as children. So the visual aspect really helps out a lot and also helps to create questions um, that may be asked. And we do have a list of questions. So at the end of all presentations, if you have any questions, 
I'm going to ask you that you enter those in the chat box. We're not going to be having live conversations due to some technical difficulties that happen um, on July 29th. You know, this is a parent forum. If you have any perspectives as far as Black Lives Matters, any type of community related stuff that you want to discuss with me, I have open door policy. You can come see me anytime you like to have that type of conversation. But this is for our parents to um, get a better understanding of what the new normal will look like. So again, thank you. Thank you for joining us. District's reopening plan. <clears throat> again, overview of this plan is very simple. Um, we collaborated with uh, the Department of Health, the CDC, State Education Department, um, Govern Governor's Office to put a plan together, again, that helps students, staff, parents get an idea of what the new normal will look like and the re-entering of our students into the school district. And speaking of plans, I know there was some discrepancies listed in the local newspaper. Our plan was um, submitted to SED. We did verify the Department of Health received not only our plan, but an affirmation and receipt that they received it. So we should not be on a list, you know, and that's embarrassing for me, uh, you know, as a leader to see your name, your school district on a list. So I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, sometimes when you deal with government officials and different things, sometimes it, the, the T's aren't crossed and the I's aren't dotted. So um, we did submit our stuff on time and I do have receipts um, to verify that. Guiding principles. Again, most of the guiding principles are compliance related issues. We learned from the March through June, um, you know, school closure that students needed technology, students needed hot uh, Wi-Fi access, students needed materials. You have to remember during that time, the governor was closing schools in two week increments and the schools didn't really close until May 1st for the extended of the school year. Um, so, you know, having two week increments and disruption, it was hard to gain consistency until we had a fine, clear line of where the governor was headed. So, um, you know, we know there were some gaps. We do thank you for all of the great comments we received, the hard work, but we know there are gaps. We know there were gaps in several different aspects. So this school year, we're gonna try to close those gaps. Um, we're gonna start the school year off for instruction on Monday, September 14th. We're gonna have four full days of professional development for our staff to make sure that everyone's on the same page, everyone understands the expectations, the procedures, et cetera. So our school staff, part of phase one, all of them will be back on campus um, providing remote instruction from their classroom. So that's the expectation. You know, a lot of them, well, all of them were presenting information from their homes. We need staff back here on campus um, for accountability issues and also for availability issues. You may have a, a parent who wants to come in and schedule an appointment to meet with teacher. It's difficult to do that online and I know many of our teachers were working up to 10, 11 o'clock in the evening, um, uh, working with parents and working with students, but we want to make sure that our staff is here um, and providing instruction, answering those key questions that may become available from staff and students. Again, clear communication is very important moving forward. No gaps. Chronological timeline of events. Just go through a couple of these. Um, So again, March 1st, 2020, the governor announced the first confirmed case of COVID in New York and directs the Department of Health to declare a public health emergency. There was an issue in New Rochelle, New York, Westchester County, uh, that became a hotbed for COVID. And those issues transpired and, and spread throughout the state. On March 16th, the governor signs executive order, closed all schools, March 18, 2020. We actually closed on March 17th, 2020 and our mill program began the next day on the 18th. Distributed Chromebooks on hotspots April 1st. We found there were a select few of students who did not have Chromebooks. Not only that, they did not have Wi-Fi hotspot access. So again, we wanna thank Mr. Shah. He really took the bull by the horns and he was able to secure a grant um, through our county legislator. So thank you to Mr. Libero who also serves as a teacher in the district, but he's a county legislator 
as well as the Catskill Educational Foundation who helped support that grant. So with that grant, we provided hotspot access. Although the grant has dried up, the money has dried up in the school district, we're gonna continue with making sure that we subscribe to our local cable companies for, um, again, for students who need that hotspot access. So we're gonna continue that momentum. And again, we thank Mr. Shah and all of our government uh, officials for assisting us with that. April 2nd, the governor started to close schools in two week increments. He also canceled spring break. We had to provide instruction through spring break. So our students lost spring break, but um, school ending early in June, um, that school break was compensated by early uh, closure of the school year. April 15th, the Board of Regents canceled all regents exams and um, grades three through eight assessments, including um, the grades four through eight science assessment as well. May 1st, this is when the governor made his big announcement. He decided to close schools for the remainder of the school year. June 11th, we began to be proactive. We put uh, together a school uh, committee, a reopening committee, and the committee consists of our SAVE committee, our results teams on both campuses. Our results team is comprised of department leaders, teachers, administrators. Uh, we have representatives in each and every school. So those individuals came together to assist us with um, our reopening plan and or provide us with uh, recommendations or suggestions. So we thank them again in advance. Last day of instruction for students was on June 16, 2020, and we had our second reopening meeting on June 25th. On July 8th, the governor sets deadlines for state as the first week of August for school reopening guidance. June, July 10th, we sent out a survey to staff and families to provide feedback for us to help us with our reopening plan. And I'll go over some of that data that we received from our parents and staff momentarily. Um, we had our reopening of schools committee, the third one on July 23rd. We had our fourth on July 25th, excuse me, on 24th, and we had our parent meeting on July 30th. So the governor mentioned that parents and staff need to be involved. We were ahead of the curve with that, with making sure that people had feedback, people had access to our plan. So you know, before the governor said that um, staff and, and parents need to be involved, we were way ahead of that because we believe that our stakeholders have a voice and we take that voice very seriously. Presentation occurred on July 29th. This is when I made my recommendation to the Board of Education to start in a phased in reentry. Well, there are three phases in my plan. Um, many of the surrounding school districts and school districts across the state, as you can tell now, are also phasing in their students back on campus. I just think it's the common sense thing to do. You know, we want to learn from others' mistakes, unfortunate mistakes, but we do not want to put our students or staff at risk. We want to do things in a common sense type of manner. So, you know, we were one of the first in the area to mention a phased in um, reopening process. So, you know, students will be back uh, depending upon what happens with the CDC and infection rates. We're anticipating students being back on Tuesday, October 13th. We submitted our school reopening plan on July 31st. The governor made his decision on Friday, August 7th regarding the reopening of schools. He allowed school districts to reopen um, providing us with flexibility for the reopening. So we thank him in advance. And again, August through September, and through the whole entire school year, we're gonna to continue to prepare, adjust. Um, this is a working document on uh, that reopening plan. If you look at our website, you will see information related to contact tracing, testing, the virtual learning plan. We have a new normal video. We suggest that you take a look at that video several different times with your, with your, uh, your spouse, um, with your children, to make sure that you have a better understanding of what the new normal will look like if you decide to choose the hybrid model. So speaking of that, a letter and survey went home this week. You should have received that. If not um, yesterday, you should receive it today. Again, we ask that you look at the video in its entirety before making a decision. We need that information back by uh, Friday, August 21st. And I know there was some questions regarding you know, can we wait up until the last minute? I think as, you know, we need that information in advance to prepare for scheduling, to prepare for teaching assignments. There are gonna have to be some reshuffling 
of students on the elementary level. And I will talk about that um, toward the end of the presentation, but we need that information as soon as possible. If you do have a change of heart before students come back in, obviously we can set up individual meetings, but we need information in advance to make, uh, to make sure that things are organized moving forward. So thank you. Again, State Department of Education provided us with a 145 page document that was compliance related issues also indicated there were guidelines with reopening schools. So we use that information from that guidance to create our reopening plan. Stakeholder feedback, 929 parents responded to our survey, 263 staff members responded as well. Uh, the governor wanted us to create three different types of plans, 100% in-person instruction, the hybrid model, which is two days of instruction, separated by groups, a group A and group B. A group A would be here Monday, Tuesday. Uh, Wednesday would be synchronous or asynchronous instruction for students. And Thursday and Friday would be uh, group B. Now, Wednesdays and Saturdays, um, we we're in the process of hiring uh, a cleaning agency to come in on Wednesday afternoons or the evening and also Saturdays all day to do a thorough deep down cleaning. You know, our custodians do a great job. As you looked at previous presentations, um, when we did our car parade and prior to that, they're doing an outstanding job. But with this pandemic, we want to double down just like we do with safety and security or with the armed retired officers and also the Raptor management system. We want to double down when it comes to cleaning here in the district. So on Wednesdays, Tuesday, group A is leaving as far as students. Wednesday, we have a cleaning crew coming in doing a deep cleaning before our group B comes in on Thursday. And when group B leaves on Friday, that thorough cleaning will happen again on Saturday in preparation for group A to come back into the district. So again, if you look at the video, you'll see how we separate desks. We're putting plastic, um, plastic covering on top of group B desk so that those desks uh, remain clean and also there's social distancing between students who are coming in on grade, grade um, group A. So that's very important. And again, C, the 100% virtual instruction model, that's online. That's what we're starting with from September 14th through October 9th. We have two slides on staff survey information. Again, the preference from staff for teaching and learning model for the fall the majority of our staff wanted in-person instruction 100%. Unfortunately, we cannot do that. We do not have enough space to bring back our students 100%. Um, so we will be out of compliance with CDC regulations. In addition, if we had to bring our students back and comply with social distancing, we would have to hire more staff. So we'd be out of budget, the approved budget, we would be way out of bounds with bringing back or hiring more staff if we needed to do 100%. Um, in-person instruction with CDC regulations. So that's very important to note. The second survey results from staff. Based on current CDC recommendations, check all you think should be mandatory. Again, the daily temperatures, adhering to social distancing and wearing masks, you can see the breakdown of percentages with regards to that. You know, the majority of our staff take this, take this seriously. We have a uh, code of conduct and district-wide safety plan meeting on Wednesday. There's language um, within those recommendations mandating that people wear masks, particularly in common areas, in hallways, in lounges, in main offices. You know, when a teacher or his or her assistant or aide is in the classroom, they can socially distance because the room is at large. So they will have to use their professional judgment with that. But for the most part, our students and staff will be required to wear masks. Students will be required to wear masks on the bus. In our buildings, there will be mask breaks in uh, the classrooms. Again, it's up to the teacher's discretion to provide those mask breaks. When students have their lunch, um, obviously they will be social distance, um, but you know they cannot eat their lunch with the mask on. So again, if you look at the video, it shows you how we're gonna separate our students. We're gonna provide plexiglass. If you look at the presentation from Mr. Bragg in the cafeteria, you know, students are sitting on the opposite side of one another, but you didn't see the plexiglass that we're gonna install on those tables to provide separation between students. So that, those items are being ordered as well. 
parent survey information. Again, the majority of our parents want 100% in-person instruction. Unfortunately, we cannot do that at this particular time. If school reopens either 100% um, in person or hybrid model, would you send your child to school? 35% said yes, 32% are unsure, and 33% said no. So again, the majority of our parents are either saying no or they're unsure. So again, hopefully the, these virtual town hall meetings and hopefully um, um, you know, the new normal video will assist with that, with changing those percentages. If school opens on a hybrid model, to enforce social distancing, what is your preference? Alternate days or alternate weeks? Again, the majority of our parents want alternate days, meaning that their child will be in school the same week, either on a group A model or a group B model. So alternate weeks, meaning the students will be in school one week, and then the opposite week, another group of students will be in. Again, the majority of our uh, parents do not want that model. Would you be concerned with having a school staff member take your child's temperature each morning upon entry? 88% of our parents said no. Again, looking at the video, our students who take transportation, um, their temperatures will be checked before they um, get on the bus. We're asking our parents to be at the bus stop with their child, also to take their temperature before reporting to the bus stop. If your child's temperature is above 100 degrees, your child will not be allowed to get on that bus and your child will have to go back home um, can I expose that temperature to other children on the bus or kids in the, in the school building? If your student, you know, if your child is a walker or is dropped off, your child is dropped off, we're gonna have staff taking temperature before your child exits the vehicle. If your child is a walker, before your child enters the building, his or her temperature will be checked. So again, we're taking this very, very seriously um, with adhering to guidelines and regulations. So there's no flexibility when it comes to masks. There's no flexibility when it comes to temperature checks. Does your child have a cloth or some type of face mask? Again, the majority of our parents, 93% said yes. Would you have concerns about your child being required to wear a mask in school? 48% said yes, 52% said no. Again, those 48% of parents need to really understand that their child needs to wear a mask until these regulations are uplifted, until there's some type of um, you know, cure for COVID-19, um, your child has to wear a mask. There's no flexibility with that unless there's a mask break uh, within that particular classroom. So if you're uncomfortable with your child wearing a mask in school, maybe you should select the remote 100% virtual model for the remainder of the school year. Are you, your child, or any member in your household in a higher risk category for COVID-19? 54% said yes, 46% said no. Again, if you have an immune compromised position, if your child has one, your child will need some type of medical documentation to provide to our nurse's office. Um, in addition to that, you know, you may have elderly parents at home. You know, we would hate for your child to come to school to become infected, then infect your elderly parents. I mean, God forbid, we don't want anything happening to our students, our parents, or any of their um, you know, older parents, so grandparents. So we don't want that happening here. So again, we're taking this very, very seriously. It would be difficult for me to sleep at night. I'm having difficulty right now sleeping at night with this going on, but if someone got sick and someone passed away due to a school mishap, it'll be very, very difficult for, for me to sleep at night. So again, we take this very seriously. Recommendation, recommended models of instruction, Again, going through this, the hybrid model, this is a visual. Again, full day of instruction for group A on Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday is synchronous or asynchronous learning uh, remotely. And Thursday will be group B in person. Now, what is synchronous and asynchronous? Synchronous is live instruction, just like we're doing this live virtual town uh, hall meeting. So the teacher will be reporting live in his or her classroom, providing instruction. Asynchronous learning is when the children work independently. So the teacher provides some type of uh, assignment, um, you know, online, the child's responsibility is to complete that assignment and return it to uh, the teacher. So that's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. There's some advantages and disadvantages between the hybrid model 
Many of the advantages are face-to-face -face interaction, be able to group students and schedule them together. Grouping students, when it comes to the hybrid model, we're gonna do our best as a priority to make sure our families, siblings attend school on the same days. So if you have multiple children in multiple school buildings, we wanna make sure that your children are in the same group, whether they're all in group A or all in group B. So I want you to know that in advance, better able to track students in the hybrid model, increase levels of communication, pairing teachers to provide support to students. Some of the disadvantages, lack of engagement. We learned from March to June that our students weren't engaged. Many of our students thrive off of social interaction, whether it's a competitive type of situation. I know I'm a competitive person, so I like to be in front of the teacher or in front of that athletic coach, making sure that I'm the very best and many of our students thrive on that. So we know, um, you know, with the hybrid model, with the remote model, that type of competitiveness and social interaction rarely occurs to the level where it needs to be if students were here on 100% in person. The virtual instruction model, again, is on our website, and you see a copy of this here on the screen. Every day, the students receive virtual instruction. So that's something that we're going to start the school year off with. We're distributing Chromebook um, Chromebooks um, from, excuse me, from September 8th through 11th. We're going to have a tent set up uh, in the back of our high school near the gymnasium interest, distributing Chromebooks at hot spots at that particular point. We want to make sure by Monday, September 14th, all of our students have access to technology, access to hot spots. So everyone starts on the same page. So that's very, very important. Some of the advantages and disadvantages when it comes to virtual instruction. Again, advantages of consistency. Students' experience would not be interrupted should there be a school closure due to COVID. You know, we're really unsure what's going to happen. You know, we're putting all these plans together, but the governor comes back and, and indicates that, um, you know, the infection rate is above 9%. We're going to be forced to close down. So, you know, no matter what type of plans we put in place, whether it's hybrid, whether it's 100% um, instruction, there may become a time that we have to close down. So it's very important that you know that. Eliminates classroom exposure is another advantage. Building digital capacity. Many of our students have high capacity when it comes to technology, whether it's through computer use, their cell phone, or any type of video gaming system. Some of the disadvantages with our new students pre-K and kindergarten, you know, our new students and staff to the district. It's a disadvantage having the virtual instruction. We know that. So when we start phasing students back into the school district, we're going to start with our pre-K and K um, and our special education students and our ELL students. So pre-K and K at the elementary school will be back in first, um, grade six at the middle school and grade nine at the high school. In addition to that, all of our students who have an IEP 504 or a second English, um, English second language learners, those students will be back in school. Those students who have an IEP 504 English language learners, those students will be here four out of five days of the week. So that's very, very important when it comes to the hybrid model that our parents know that if you have a student who's classified or if you have a student who um, is an English language learner, those students will be here four out of five days of the week to make sure that they get all their mandated uh, compliance related type of um, support. So that's very important for, to note. Professional development, again, September 8th through 11th, we're providing professional development to all our staff. How we prepare with PPE, mask. Again, we have 16,600 masks in stock. We ordered another 52,400. 16,000 pairs of gloves, 150 gallons of hand sanitizer, six Genion machines. Mr. Witt did a great job in uh, showcasing our Genion machines as well as um, you know, the bus supervisor from first student. You'll see them spray the sanitizing mist um, to keep uh, things clean. The students transition in and out of the classroom for the day and also on our buses, those items will be used. We use MERV 8 filters. Those filters, top of our classrooms and rooftops, those are changed every three months. And we have 1,000 boxes of tissue. We also have our temperature scans. I believe we have 50 of those in stock. And those have been given to uh, each building. 
We also um, have, um, we also ordered uh, hand sanitizing machines as well as temperature scans for our staff. So our staff, their temperature has to be taken each and every morning before they come in. They will also have to complete a questionnaire every morning before they come in. You know, the questionnaire is pretty much identifying, or at least they have to identify whether they've been exposed to COVID or whether their temperature uh, is over a certain uh, threshold. So that's very important. Our staff will have to complete a questionnaire and their temperature has to be taken as well before they enter into our buildings. My recommendations. Again, our district calendar was modified. We moved our September 4th, excuse me, third professional development date to the 8th. And we also added three professional development days. As I mentioned before, September 9th, 10th, and 11th. Students will start school on September 14th virtually. And uh, the, the, our board approved us to purchase additional PPE. Phase one. Again, we need our staff back here on campus, all of our staff. Our 10 month staff will be back here on September 8th. Again, our students will start remotely on September 14th. Chromebook distribution, 8th through 11th. The reentry new normal videos on our website now for parents to make a decision. And we also provided parents with the option of hybrid or remote. So that survey is very important for you to complete. Uh, we ask that you send it back. But again, as we get closer to October 13th, if you have a change of heart, it's important that you call your building principal, set up individual meetings to make a decision. But, you know, we really need that survey information back by next Friday. You can drop off the survey here in my office in the back of my building here, 343 West Main Street, or you can mail it in. Um, so it's very important that we have that survey information. Phase two, October 13th, 2020 through January 29th, 2021. Once you make your selection, your choice will be locked in for the remainder of the first semester. We can't have students going from remote to hybrid and from hybrid back to remote. It's gonna create a lot of problems when it comes to transportation and scheduling. So once you make your decision as a parent, it's very important that you understand um, that we have to adhere to that until the beginning of the second semester, which is February 1st, 2021. At that particular time, we want all of our students back here on campus um, and we want to make sure that, that any parents who want their child to remain on remote instruction, that they still have that option to move forward in that manner. So that's my presentation. I'm going to shift to our building principles. We're going to start off with our elementary school with um, Mr. Rivers. Submit. We have three people who are waiting. Let's make sure we admit those people. Mr. Rivers, I'm gonna ask you to unmute, unmute yourself. Good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing today? So uh, Dr. Cook uh, went, thoroughly went through the plan uh, as far our, as our re-entry uh, starting September 14th. I just wanted to kind of dive a little bit deeper into the elementary plan uh, as far as the remote learning is concerned and then shift over to the hybrid starting in October. Um, like Dr. Cook said, we are going to start off with remote learning. Um, during that model, all students are going to receive meaningful opportunities, remote opportunities Monday through Friday. Uh, the idea is that for math and ELA, we will have uh, students will be meeting with their teachers every single day, Monday through Friday, five days a week. Social studies and science will be every other day or two to three times per week. We will have opportunities for a teacher or for family to communicate and talk with our teachers during office hours. Um, and it's very important that we have all of our, our students participate in our online or virtual learning. Um, I think in the fall or in the springtime, we had a, probably about 50% not a lot of people logging in uh, consistently. I think now that we have a, a definite plan and a course of action, we need definitely have to have those students logging in, um, coming up with a schedule, some consistency throughout throughout that um, this online period. Um, like Dr. Cook said, if you need a Chromebook or internet access, we are providing that for every student. Um, I think in, in the springtime we had 
one Chromebook per family. Uh, we are, Dr. Cook has graciously allowed us to have one Chromebook per student. So you can have multiple students um, in, in a home online at the same time with, with those devices. So make sure that if, if you need one, contact our office so we can get, get one for you. Um, related services or, or excuse me, um, special areas are gonna run similar to what we did in the springtime. Our special area teachers will create a lesson per week, put it on their, on their Google Classroom, and the students have that week to complete that task or complete that activity, um, similar to what we do in, in the school year as well. Um, Related services, uh, as far as IEPs and OT and PT, we're still working on a plan for that, but we are gonna either provide that virtually or can be able to come into the classroom or into the school to get your OT or PT services or speak. So we'll, um, we'll try to flesh that out as much as we can moving forward. Um, attendance is gonna be very uh, vital during this um, virtual plan, because when we shift over to the hybrid plan and trying to create our our A day and B day students, we wanna make sure we have as much data as possible to try to keep similar and like skills together. So when we are in the hybrid model, teachers can really focus on um, skill deficiency and really focus on that, uh, on those small groups of, of students and really take advantage of that, that time. So uh, trying to be on virtually every day is gonna be very important. Um, Shifting over to the hybrid model, Dr. Cook did a very good job explaining the hybrid model. Uh, we are gonna have group A and group B, Monday and Tuesday for group A. Uh, there'll be in-person instruction. Again, we definitely want that uh, detailed skilled so we can, the teachers can really devote a lot of time with that. Uh, and Thursday, Friday will be group B in person. And while the other opposite end, they'll be doing remote instruction. Um, Wednesdays will be used for either uh, staff development or staff uh, meetings, but also create different um, uh, synchronous and asynchronous activities for the student. Um, do some, definitely do some smaller groups instruction going on there. Uh, the special areas are gonna be important. Um, in the past, we would have a grade level go to a special during a certain period. This year, we're going to try to shift it to where uh, art will be maybe in grade one for, for one day because you do have that, that half year and half out. So we're trying to shift our schedule so that we have all of uh, our students receive their special area instruction. Um, again, Dr. Cook mentioned that once we go from the virtual to the hybrid, you have an opportunity to see what is the best fit for you. Um, you have to make that choice. And obviously we're going to uh, keep that choice until the end, end of January if you wanna stay remote. All right. Uh, I know people have a lot of concerns about safety um, and professional or not, uh, safety and ma maintaining social distance and following the CDC guidelines. The, the video that we created uh, really outlines how we're going to do that starting off at the bus stop. Uh, an aide from the bus will take the temperature of their students. If they pass, they will be allowed on the bus. If not, they will have to return back home. Uh, we separated out where students go into the into the building off the bus, one bus at a time. Students in grades four and five will go in by the preschool playground and the end of the green wing. Grades uh, K through four or K through three will go in the main main entrance one at a time. Again, maintaining social distancing. And then parent drop off or student drop off. We will have uh, some faculty out there or some staff out there taking temperatures inside of the vehicle. If they pass, they will be allowed to to exit the vehicle and into the building. If not, they would have to uh, return back home with, with the families. Uh, anytime that they are in the building and in the hallways, we are going to maintain um, social distancing as best as possible. And also the students are required to wear their masks in the inside or in the hallways. Um, and anytime that we cannot social distance, the mask should be, be worn. I suggest that families purchase one or two cloth masks and rotate through them. Um, and keep them with students. We will have those disposable ones handy on, on site in case someone forgets it or loses it. But uh, we, we suggest that you definitely keep those masks on anytime that you're in the hallway, common areas moving from classroom to classroom. In the building, uh, the classrooms will be set up where they are a, their students are six feet apart while they're at their desk. Teachers will, and um, 
students will be wearing masks as much as possible, but if they have to take a, a break, a mask break, it is definitely uh, an area where they can do that as long as they maintain their, their six feet apart from, from each other. Teachers can come up to a student um, during that time as well, as long as they have their masks on and students have their masks on and, and check work. But obviously we, don't, we wanna try to avoid any long-term or long time 10 or 15 minutes with them and then back them up. We are gonna be dividing our purchasing plexiglass um, dividers so that we do can do some small group instruction, but during that time, obviously the, the mask must be maintained and, and stay and kept on. Hallways, uh, we, we make sure the hallways are directional. We are gonna travel on the right side of the hallway, depending on which, way, which direction you are going. We will have uh, mask or tape and uh, stopping areas where delineated on the floor or on the ground so students know how far they need, they need to be and remain away from there. Um, and obviously the classrooms are going to try to maintain our, our 36 foot square bubble. Um, lunch and recess, we ha had an opportunity to go through our cafeteria and we can maintain a six foot uh, area while we're eating lunch, while one grade level is eating lunch, the other grade level will be out on recess, but we can keep the six foot distance away from each other. Um, we're still fleshing out the exact uh, protocol for that. Either the students will be going through the line or we'll have lunches available for them um, at their tables as they get there. So again, uh, like Dr. Cook said, you can have uh, your mask off because obviously you cannot eat without with, with your masks on. But um, again, we'll have make sure that those are areas are, are six, foot, six feet apart and maintaining social distancing. Uh, recess. Um, we're going to alternate the the, pre, the primary playground and the elementary playground. So while one student or one grade level is eating, uh, one grade level will be out on the on the playground. And also, what we're going to be doing there is creating different stations. So one day you might be at a kickball station, the next day you might be on the playground, next day you might be on the basketball. So we are still maintaining those pods. We're not intermingling um, different teachers, um, and then each each day it'll, it'll rotate. Um, and then obviously it gives us time if we're alternating primary and elementary, it gives us, gives us time to disinfect the, the playgrounds if needed. Um, restrooms and water fountains. Obviously we're gonna have, uh, uh, we're gonna have a monitor at each bathroom, making sure that there's only one student in the bathrooms at all times. One, one student exits the bathroom, another one can enter back in. And also at the water fountains we have uh, spots available or spots on the ground so they can maintain their um, um, six foot distancing. We're gonna shut down all of the traditional water fountains and we do have bottle fillers um, located throughout the building. I think we're gonna actually install another one in the gymnasium. So we will have more wa water filling stations for everybody. I suggest for parents that um, you purchase a, a water bottle or something and similar to that students can, can um, open up the or fill the water bottles at the water filling stations. Make sure you put your name on them because those are uh, hot commodities. Um, definitely going to have posters and all kinds of visible um, reminders of washing hands, uh, safety, maintaining social distancing throughout the building. Uh, we'll have enough staff around to encourage that as well. Um, then we got dismissal procedure. During our dismissal time, typically in the past, we would just dismiss the whole grade level at a time. This year, however, we are going to dismiss either classroom or grade level at a time. So there is less traffic, less congestion in the hallways. Again, we still need to maintain our social distancing. We still have to maintain wearing our masks. We still have to maintain uh, a single file and exiting on one side or um, directional hallways. Uh, then it goes into uh, student pickup at the, at the end of the day. Uh, Typically, we would be in the cafeteria. Again, we still have those areas in the cafeteria where we can keep our six foot area. We will make sure we have students sitting in those areas, social distancing. We'll have a monitor outside with a radio, walkie talkie calling in and, and dismissing one student at a time. Again, this process is gonna take a little bit longer than it has in the past. We ask you to be patient with us while we work out some of the kinks, but um, I think that is the best way to maintain social distancing, maintain everyone's um, um, safety, health and safety at, at moving forward. Um, our nurses station, we are separating our nurses this year. We used to have both nurses in one area, in one, in one room. This year we are having an upstairs nurses station and a downstairs one. 
again, to limit the traffic and the flow in there. I think from September to March, we had over 7,000 visits to the nurse's office last year. So again, we want to definitely um, limit as much as traffic as there and possible. We have an isolation room in both nurse's office. So if someone does have uh, symptoms of COVID or symptoms, high fever, coughing, et cetera, we can separate them and isolate them um, until we can call families to come pick them up. Uh, that's pretty much that it in a, nut, a nutshell. Again, the student expectations are that we need to have students arrive for the virtual meets on time. If you are scheduled for a nine o'clock meet, make sure that you are there by nine o'clock. They're expected to attend all online meetings. We're gonna to try to keep it very consistent. Uh, if you have a meeting every day at nine, that, that would be that every day. Um, so the consistency is gonna be in, in vital for the families and vital for our, our teachers and our staff to make sure that we can deliver the, the most meaningful instruction as possible. Um, I think that's pretty much it for my presentation. Um, Dr. Cook, is there anything else that you would like me to expand on? Oh, one last thing, if you could, uh, please make sure that your email address, your phone numbers, your contact information is up to date through our registrar. Um, we send out multiple either um, emails, multiple mailings, and we do get a, a number of them back saying that the email or, or the addresses are incorrect. Um, in order for us to you know, communicate successfully, we need to have those correct information. Um, just give us a call or send us an email with your correct information. Uh, we did purchase the Remind app last year for the entire district. We use that at the elementary school exclusively. If a teacher sends you a Remind app um, notification, make sure that you log in and, and do that. Um, Google Classroom, Google Meet is going to be our primary uh, sources of delivery of instruction during this time. So uh, make sure that we are we can get into the Google Classroom, Google Meet. That is all for, I, for me. Is there any questions I can possibly answer? I don't think Dr. Cook said you weren't going to do it during this presentation, but if you do have any questions, please email me. My email address is up there on the, uh, on the screen as right now, or email Mr. Schlenker, or you always, can always call the office. And yeah, we're gonna take Thank questions you. at the end via chat. People can also send their questions to Mr. Miske, as well as give Mr. Miske a call at 518-943-4696 to ask your question. And I'll read some of the questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Rivers. Thank you. Next up is our middle school. Ms. Overboss here, I'm asking her to unmute. Good morning, everyone. Wait for Dr. Cook to pull it. While he's pulling it up, John Rivers, you did such an exceptional job. Mine will probably a lot, be a lot shorter and sweeter. Um, we'll concentrate more on what's going on on the secondary campus. Before I start, I think it's really important that everyone understands that the middle school and high school since we share a campus have worked very closely together. So you'll see a lot of similarities in our procedures, obviously um, different group of students. So there will be some things that are different, but overall we want to make sure that the parents have consistency if they have a sixth grader or a, a junior. So I'd like to start Dr. Cook, if you don't mind jump, jumping right to page four, um, because the, the first couple pages we're just talking about the difference between the remote learning and the hybrid. And I think that Dr. Cook and John have done a really nice job explaining it. So I wanna talk about what does full remote learning look like in the middle school? This is really important because the feedback that we received last year um, in our first time trying to do full remote learning was about the communication piece and the parents maybe not understanding what was happening and the students and log on. So we wanna make sure we're really clear today and moving forward on what the expectations are. So the most important thing is one of the, that all students will have access to technology. So we need to know as soon as possible if you need a Chromebook, and I believe Dr. Cook that is in the survey about who needs that type of information, what support you need. Um, we're gonna spend the first couple of, well, couple of days when we come back on the 14th online, online the teachers will be making sure the, the students and parents know what are the available technologies and how to use it. Uh, different from last year, this year students will get their schedules in the mail like they always do, but what they will be doing is they'll be following their schedule. So if they have period one math at 735, the expectation is they will be on period one math at 735. They'll be following their schedule that is sent home. They will be following their schedule, attending class using the Google Meet. 
That was something that they started last year. Over the summer, many of our teachers have actually gone to quite a few in-services on the different um, aspects of Google Meet so that we can actually enhance what we've been up to. Attendance is mandatory and the attendance policy will be followed. I'll talk a little bit more about the attendance policy towards the end, but that's really important. If your child, for example, was late um, in the middle school last year and they were supposed to be in class at 735 and they weren't, you, you received that phone call, you received that notice, your child might have had a consequence for being late or for the attendance, they might have gotten letters home. We are following that attendance policy. So it is as if they are still in school. We will have online office hours by grade level teams. As you know, any of you who have been in the middle school before, we work together in teams. We have team leaders, so we will be reaching out to parents, but at the same time, we're encouraging the parents that be the first point of contact is going to be your grade level team leader because they know exactly what's going on. However, always CC us, always let us know what's going on. Mr. Shaw and I are here to provide whatever assistance as always is needed. Um, so when we talk about the hybrid plan, we're gonna be two days on and two days off, um, three days off, excuse me. There will be packets and internet opportunities. Students, we talked about that, Google Meet Times, we'll check in. And um, one of the things that we pride ourselves in the middle school is our peak of the weeks. Our peak of the weeks go out every week with the class expectations and assignments that parents can follow along so they know exactly what's happening. So that will continue with our peak of the weeks being sent out, emailed out, and will be attached to your students' Google Classrooms. So on our next page, I, will, I wanna phase into a little bit about our hybrid learning. Um, I do wanna really emphasize what we are really excited about going into this phasing slowly because we all need to remember that for us here at the middle school, as in all the district, this is new for our teachers too. So the beginning of the first day of professional development, we're really going to be delving into the various um, forms of technology, the expectations regarding communication and attendance, and then we'll be working our way up. So when we do have the hybrid and the students are coming in, we are making sure that we are practicing CDC guidelines, we're being safe, where the students, we as educators need to understand exactly what it looks like with the masks, with the temperature. So we hope that um, we, we know when we come back for the hybrid learning model, we'll be ready to, ready to go. Um, as Mr. Rivers said, we'll have our group A and group B. One of the things we've discussed at the middle school, high school is, well, how do we break that out? What does that look like? Do we go alphabetically? Do we go by address? So those are still things that we are working out, but our goal is to make sure that it is um, what works best for families. So I'll give you an example of a group A, similar to what Mr. River said. Group A will be in school, regular schedule on Monday and Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, they will do remote learning. Opposite that is group B, they will have remote learning Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday will be the um, in school. Just to point out something with, with that, how we split them up, there are three, approximately 350 students here. And one of the things when I'm talking with some of the parents who have already called with concerns is when we cut that in half and we're looking at 175, we do have the ability here to social distance. We do have the ability when we break that in, in, in half, instead of having 24 kids in a room, having 12. Um, it, it, we've done it, we've put the plastic bags as you've seen in the video and we can do that and we can keep your students safe. So I can't stress that enough. Um, Dr. Cook, if you could go on to the next slide, please. Uh, this is going to be the most important thing. In the elementary school, there's more parent involvement. As we get to middle school, we have more pair the, of the students taking ownership. So this is really important, whether we're virtual or hybrid, we really need to stress to the students, they're expected to attend all online meets. It's not optional. If for some reason your, you, your child has a doctor's appointment or an orthodontist appointment, you would do as you normally would. You'd notify the office that they're going to be out and you would follow up with a note. That way we can keep track of our attendance. Um, students will arrive to their classes on time. That means if the class starts at 735, they need to be online ready to go at 735. Students will follow their schedules, as I said. Um, they will be prepared with their necessary materials and supplies. This is another piece that is really important for parents to know. If you need anything, we need to know so we can make sure you have that. 
If you're in a math class and you don't have a calculator, we'll provide that calculator. If you need art supplies, I spoke with Ms. Gazorian yesterday. She's making baggies to make sure all of the materials and supplies you need for your child to be successful, virtual and hybrid, we are going to make sure that you have them. We just need to make, you just need to make sure that you let us know. Um, and again, students will follow the directives and protocols and students are expected to hand in assignments and take assessments when assigned. Um, social distancing, um, as both Mr. Rivers and Dr. Cook has shared, we're going to follow the guidelines from the CDC. We are all set up with that. I know if you've seen some in the video. We will, like I said, be following the CDC protocols. Um, entry and exit protocols will be set up where we will have an entrance for the bus students to come in through the cafeteria and the drop off students and the walkers will come in through the main entry doors where we'll have their temperature taken. If they need masks, we have masks to provide them. And by the dismissal, we have it all set up. They'll be dismissed by wings. Um, transition and lunch, very similar to what uh, Mr. Rivers had shared. There was, uh, we will not be utilizing the bell system. We will be moving the kids so they are not in the hallway at the same time. We already have where students walk to the right. We already have markers down, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, we already have the one-way stairway. We will continue to do that. Lunch and recess, we've already split in half, so the students are familiar with that, and we'll continue to do that. As much as possible, we're going to let them outside. One of the things that we did talk about were having students um, stay in class when possible and having the teachers move. I did see some comments and people have shared they were worried about their students being sitting still for a long period of time. Please know we recognize our students. We know they're middle school students. We can't expect them. Adults have a hard time sitting for hours on end, so we are not going to do that to your children. Um, our social workers, our guidance counselors, and our psychologists have come up with some fantastic PBIS and no place for hate activities to make sure that students are engaged both in and out of the classrooms. Bathroom use is the same as uh, Mr. Rivers had shared and the same with the nurse's office. And just to reiterate, the most important thing is attendance expectations, is making sure your student is up where they need to be, online when they need to be, and then again, communicating with us if there is more um, information that is needed. One of the things we talked about at the middle school uh, is that we would like to see middle school town hall meetings with parents. Obviously, as we have just seen, we uh, there's some kinks and things we may have to work out with that. So it would be invite only for your grade level teams, I'm thinking. We have the Remind app, the peak of the week, school tool grades, participation and attendance, and Google Classroom. Parents, if you have not yet signed up for school tool, particularly those parents coming in from sixth to seventh grade, I'm sorry, fifth to sixth grade, you will be getting that information home. And again, your team leaders will be reaching out to all of you at different grade levels and providing any additional information you might need. So Dr. Cook, that's, that sums it up for us. All right, Ms. Chalutin, unfortunately, I'm not gonna put up your presentation, but if you could just give an overview um, of what the high school's gonna do. We're gonna put the presentations online and on Facebook and Twitter for people as well. Um, so they can so they look, take a look at it. Thank you, Ms. Obama. Hi. Okay, so ours is going to be even shorter than um, the middle school and the elementary school because everyone has done a great job and we have worked together to develop these plans. When it comes to both the virtual and hybrid model, students at the high school will be following the, their daily schedule. So those are the times that they will sign on during their virtual learning meets. Um, and during virtual learning, you're expected to attend all Google meetings and classes. The teachers will be developing office hours for both the virtual and hybrid models that we will share out. Um, and student attendance will be accounted for. Students are attended to, are expected to attend the year classes five days a week during virtual learning. So that is something that they should have that expectation to do just like they would during the regular school year. Um, when it comes to virtual learning, 100% virtual, it does not matter if you're on the A or B schedule. 
you will be signing on or logging on during your teacher directed time for that class. Participation in these classes are really important and uh, a parent will receive notification if a child does not attend class. And if there is for some reason an excused absence, just like with before and what Ms. Overbaugh said, you are going to notify the office and follow that up with a note um, through email. Please come to your virtual meetings prepared to do work, to have, the, uh, to have the tools necessary that you will need in that class, and that will be given to you by your teacher, probably on Google Classroom, or on Google Classroom. Um, and you're also gonna, speaking of that, you're gonna follow the directives and protocols of your teacher for that class. So make sure that during your first week of school, if you have any questions, you ask them of that particular teacher. At the high school level, you will have your six to eight different teachers. And so just ask them what the protocols are for their class. Make sure you're handing in your assignments on time. This is, and you are handing them in, even if it's virtual or hybrid, you're gonna follow and the deadlines that the teacher has set. When it comes to the hybrid model, again, teachers will be, or your classes will be your nine period class day that's in the school tool. Or if you are at CTE um, or any of the other programs that we have at the high school level, you will be following that. So make sure that you know that and that it will be regardless of your virtual or hybrid model. When it comes to the hybrid model, you will be in class uh, Monday and Tuesday. And if you're in the A or B group or orange and blue, whatever we decide, um, that you will be here for two days of the week. And then the other three, you will either have synchronous or asynchronous learning provided by your teacher. Again, those protocols will be provided by your teacher when it comes to the hybrid model. Students in the hybrid model are expected to attend all online needs. So if your teacher says you need to log on during this time, please make sure that you do it. Sorry guys, I just have to look on my, um, the paper version, so because it can't be projected. All students who, and Dr. Cook alluded to this earlier, any student who's a special education student, an ENL student, or special circumstances, they may be here four days out of the week. When it comes to the hybrid model, just like Dr. Uh, Mr. Rivers mentioned, we are gonna have one-way hallways, we are gonna have um, six feet apart stickers, and students are gonna be in the bathroom one at a time. Those are all things that we will have. We will also not have lockers. So that's something to keep in mind as you're prepping for this year. And students are expected to wear masks when they are in the hallways, in their classrooms, um, unless otherwise directed by a teacher or staff member. When it comes to dismissing from those classes, it will be staggered. Uh, and the teachers will, or the staff will sanitize the desk. In the hybrid model, um, students will have lunch in just like their regular three periods of lunch. We've had regular three period of lunch. Uh, students are expected to sit two at a table. And uh, in the video, this was shown two at a table. They'll be called up one to get their lunch. And then at the conclusion of the lunch period, it will be sanitized. The tables and chairs and stuff will be sanitized by our staff members. When you enter and exit the building, it will be um, if you are staff, you will be coming from the gym. If you are a walker or if you are being dropped off by a parent, you will come through the main entrance. And if you are at drop, being dropped off by the bus, you will be coming through the auditorium. Uh, we've mentioned pretty much everything else. We have been trying to be consistent in the district. So um, that is all I have, Dr. Cook, unless you would like me to ask something else. Say no, Mr. Solution, thank you so much. And Mr. Bragg couldn't make it. You did a job. Well, job well done. I'm filling in for Mr. Bragg. And job to all of our principals and assistant principals who are on um, taking their Saturdays to um, to be with us. So at this particular point, we're going to entertain um, questions that were submitted uh, in advance. 
to Ms. Kaminsky. So again, if you don't hear answers to your question, we're gonna list these online. Um, today's presentation, with the exception of some technical difficulties, will be listed as well, as well as the presentation. So I just want people to know that. Additionally, you will receive school-specific, back-to-school specific information uh, regarding your child's schedule, regarding supplies, et cetera, that need to be purchased. That information should be going out pretty soon. Again, we need those surveys back to make sure um, that you get the particular information that you need. So back to school information is forthcoming. So please continue to be patient with us. So some of the questions we were able to gather, um, what are the stats of a teacher does not respond to an email? Again, our teachers are gonna be here on campus our teachers are gonna to respond to email um, within a 24 to 40 hour period. My preference is 24 hours. Um, if a teacher does not respond to you as a parent or does not respond uh, to your student, the first level uh, of accountability takes place at the building level of the, the administration. If you don't get a response from administration, please feel free to call my office and you, you will get a response, um, a timely response. So. Again, that's a requirement. Teachers are required to respond and teachers again will be physically here on campus starting on September 8th. Will the school be providing Chromebooks? Yes, the school will be providing Chromebooks. Chromebook distribution will take place um, at the back of the high school. We have a tent set up between September 8th through 11th from nine until 3 p.m. So again, that information is gonna be forward to you shortly and the parent informational information is going home. When will you find out the students, teachers? Again, information will be going home shortly. Again, will there be expectations for teachers in regards to communicating with students during remote instruction? Yes, there will be expectations. We're working on those procedures and protocols, but yes, teachers are required to respond to our parents and our students. Our, are teachers going to live stream or tape lectures to present and teach new material during a remote instruction? We're working that out with the teachers union regarding that tape instruction. So that has to be worked out, particularly on our secondary level, whether your child is in school or at home or remote, depending upon what group you're in, group A or B, or if you chose remote as we're starting out, with the school year, there will be live instruction on our secondary level when we do switch to hybrid. So teachers will be responsible for making sure on the secondary level, six to 12, the children are learning uh, remotely and in class providing live instruction. In regards to the cleaning procedures, I did some online research in regards to the cleaning being used on our buses, as well as the Genion misters in the school. I read as much as the ingredients in both of those products as I could with my limited knowledge, but I'm concerned with the overall amount of chemical use that the children will be exposed to on a daily basis. I appreciate hearing that the windows will be open on the bus when feasible due to the weather. However, can anything be said towards the ventilation in the school to prevent constant inhalation of chemicals being used in the classroom? Also, since the mister does not require any wiping off desk after the mist sits for a dwell time, there's also a risk of contact absorption by children where they're sitting at their desk and touching surfaces. Has there been discussion with any health officials in the chemical environment within the buildings? I understand the chemical use is quite catch 22 because we want to prevent the spread of germs. However, it does come with a cost to overall health of children. The chemicals that we use, whether it's on the bus or whether it's through, um, you know, in the school system, those chemicals are approved for us to use. We wouldn't use things that are not approved for us to use in schools. We do have a list of products um, that we have to comply with. So going back to um, the Genion mist machine, when that mist is sprayed, um, the mist is quickly absorbed onto desk. Usually it, take, it dries up within a minute or two um, upon application. So. You know, your child wouldn't be coming into a wet or slippery desk, wet or slippery floor. It usually takes one or two minutes to dry up on contact. So there's not a need to worry about that. 
Yes, we have consulted with the health officials. Okay. Will the people using the thermometers be trained on proper use and cleaning of them? Yes. Again, training will be conducted from uh, September 8th to 11th with our staff who's gonna have uh, the thermometers. Will there be any after school activities sports during phase one and phase two? Right now, when it comes to athletic um, situations, um, the New York State High School Public Athletic Association is gonna make a decision on September 21st regarding athletics. Um, initially, they were talking about moving some sports from fall to spring. The initial conversations had football and soccer being moved from fall to spring and baseball and softball being moved from spring to fall. I'm not sure where that decision, um, where the decision is with that, but I know the focus is to start on September 21st. Regarding after school activities here on district, in district, our after school activities are gonna start off remotely. So September 14th, um, if your child is in a club and that club can be um, done remotely, that's the direction we're headed. When it comes to athletics, again, we're waiting for a decision from um, the governor and also the New York State High School Public Athletic Association. So that is not clear cut. I answered that question. I believe Mr. Rivers answered this question. My son will be entering the fifth grade. I'm guessing the answer will not be the same across grade levels, but I'm curious as to what the structure of the virtual learning will be like for the first month of 100% virtual and, and thereafter, regardless of what option we choose. For example, will there be Google Meets a couple of times a week and then assignments to complete on their own? That's asynchronous uh, instruction that should take place on Wednesday. How will that work when they are in hybrid model on phase two? So if your child is participating on a hybrid model, as we indicated, they will be in person two days a week and three days a week, they will be at home. So, you know, virtual instruction will take place again on the secondary level uh, where their child is in school or at home live. When it comes to elementary, we're working out the kinks. As a former elementary teacher, I can tell you, you know, doing virtual instruction live and having 12 to 13 children sitting in front of you, that is really difficult to do. So we're working out the kinks when it comes to hybrid instruction, particularly the virtual component of that for elementary age children. So I just want you to know that we're working on those aspects of that. Thank you. Can the mask policy be changed so there's a minimum quality of mask acceptable for wearing? No bandanas and no single layers. There are studies that show how much less effective they are by allowing students to wear them. You are undermining so many other safety steps you put in place. So the mask that we wear, you know, quality of mask, I know there are different grades of them, the N95. Our nurses will be wearing N95 and they have to be fitted for those. So as far as masks, we do have appropriate masks here on site. So if a child is coming in with an appropriate mask, we have masks that we can give to your child while he or she's in, on campus. The high school lunch tables were shown to have two students per table sitting. I believe I answered this during my presentation, but I'll read the question again. The high school lunch tables were shown to have two students per table sitting facing each other. It really does not look they would be sufficiently distanced, especially given what we know about arousation during normal speech, or if a student yells or sneezes or coughs without a mask, would it be possible to increase the distance between students facing each other while the masks are off to each? So again, we're purchasing plexiglass. So if you looked at that high school lunch room model, you saw the chairs one opposite one of, of another, there will be a plexiglass divider between those students um, you know, while they're eating lunch. We'll also explain the idea of some high school students eating outside for lunch as well. We do have tables outside for high school uh, students. If my son were in a classroom where another student or faculty member had tested positive, will we be required to self-quarantine for 14 days before returning to a hybrid model? The answer is yes. The CDC is changing their regulations daily, but right now, uh, prior to the most recent um, CDC notification, 
if there's a positive case in a particular classroom and we do contact tracing, those students who were in that classroom would have to quarantine and obviously get tested and be required to stay uh, remotely for 14 days, including the staff member, in order to return to school for that particular location, obviously we have a doctor's note. So prior in previous situations, the entire school would close down, but if we're able to target a specific location, particularly a classroom where um, someone was affected, that particular classroom would close, not the entire school. That's the CDC updated guidelines. So again, that changes. I don't know if it's changed before I received my last information, but that's my understanding of it. If a student or faculty member tests positive for COVID-19, will they be required to have a negative test before returning to school? Yes. Also, I heard there were aids on the buses, which I cannot believe isn't actually a necessity, but I digress. Would each CES classroom have an aid as well? Teacher, assistant teacher, and what I like to refer to as a classroom lifeguard who is watching out for sneezes and close contact. Our primary um, classrooms, pre-kindergarten through third, have multiple adults uh, in and out of classrooms assisting. As you get up to fourth grade, when it comes to teaching assistants, usually there are one or two teaching assistants on the fourth and fifth grade level who rotate between, between classes. At the secondary level, we do have teaching assistants, aides, who do rotate. Um, at the high school, the same thing. So if we go back on a hybrid model with less students in classrooms, we'll be able to share the wealth of staff rotating in between classes to watch out for those types of things to assist with instruction. So there will be more hands on deck uh, potentially with the hybrid model in comparison if we were 100% in person. Very good question. The new normal video did not mention how CES special classes will work. For instance, will the kids be leaving their classroom to go to the music room or will those teachers be coming to them, Mr. Rivers eloquently indicated what the model will look like for um, special area classes. There are situations where teachers will be rotating from room to room, but there are situations like phys ed, if there's a nice day outside, there's enough room on our secondary campus and our elementary campus to do social distancing and still have children participate with phys ed classes and also with recess. Would the district consider allowing families to lock in their learning choice at a later date, such as the first week of October? This will allow more time to see how things progress. Very good question. Again, surveys are going home. You should have your, you should have received yours either yesterday or today and possibly early next week. We need that information back by Friday, September 21st. Uh, if you have a change of heart before we start back on Monday, uh, you know, October 13th, I'm asking you that you meet with your child's principal, assistant principal, and our guidance counselor, and we can have a more uh, detailed type of conversation. But right now, we do need to know what your initial selection or choice will be so that we can organize ourselves and have schedules and things in place to send out as early as possible. But that's a very good question. If there is a change of heart after your initial selection, um, Again, we suggest that you meet or schedule an appointment with your child's administrator uh, before we come back on, uh, before students come back on Monday, October 13th to change that selection that you initially chose. Some comments, just a comment. I'm thankful for the month of remote learning to start off with. I appreciate the efforts of the district for safety first of our students, faculty, and staff. Thank you so much. Safety is important before instruction takes place, whether it's keeping the bad guys out of our buildings or whether it makes sure we're in a healthy environment. I'm so appreciative of the new normal video that the team put out today. It really helps parents to make their own informed decisions about sending their children in. This is just a medical pet peeve. I believe this came from a health one of our parents or health professionals. Again, we thank you as essential workers. I do not think temperatures should be considered a pass or fail. No one fails a temperature check. People are either afebrile or febrile, or they have a normal temperature on an elevated uh, temp um, temperature. This seems nicer to use terms that apply more accurately 
and have less personal, personal association. Again, we are not medical professionals here, but we do um, take your suggestion as well. Let's see what else came in. Mr. Misty, we're hot off the press. If students are going to be socially distanced, have temperature checked, why will they need to wear masks while sitting? Again, the mask situation, um, we have to adhere to that. I know the CDC is saying that if children are socially distant in the classroom, that they don't have to wear their mask. I'm recommending that they wear their mask and the teachers implement a mask break. Okay, that's what we're recommending here in the Catskill Central School District to keep everyone safe. But again, that classroom teacher has a discretion to perform a half mask breaks. So again, we thank you for your questions. We will put answers to those questions on the website. We thank you again for joining us today on this Saturday. Our next town hall meeting will be Tuesday, which I believe is um, August 18th at 6 p.m. We also have another one scheduled for Thursday, August 20th at 6 p.m. We have individual uh, campus level meetings with our staff. I believe Monday is gonna be our secondary and Tuesday is gonna be our elementary. So we're constantly meeting and communicating, not only with our parents in the community, but also with our teachers prior to the governor making his statement um, about uh, stakeholder participation. So again, I thank you very much. We're gonna put our presentations online. We're also going to um, list this recording online minus some technical difficulties that we had. So thank you once again, please feel free to contact me, contact your building principal, with any further questions or concerns, please enjoy the rest of your day and stay safe. Thank you so much.